Hi everyone, this is Anne Marie Gaddy from Classic Movie Hub. I'm so happy to be hosting the first event in the Screen Classics discussion series from Classic Movie Hub and the University Press of Kentucky with co-host Citizen Screen. Tonight's event is called Growing Up Hollywood and our panelists are the children of Hollywood legends who are also successful biographers of their parents. Victoria Riskin, author of Fay Ray and Robert Riskin, A Hollywood Memoir, and William Wellman Jr., the author of Wild Bill Wellman, Hollywood Rebel. Anne Marie, I'm really also very excited because Alan Rohde is moderating the evening. Alan, as everyone may know, is a film scholar. He's a producer. He's the host of the Arthur Lyons Film Noir Festival. He programs for such organizations as the American Cinematheque, the Los Angeles Conservancy, the UCLA Film and Television Archive. Um, he's also the charter director and the treasurer of the Film Noir Foundation. And he's authored two books so far, uh, Charles McGraw, Film Noir Tough Guy, and just out on paperback from the University Press of Kentucky, Michael Curtiz, A Life in Film. As everyone can probably tell, Alan is a tireless champion of classic film. So we are very honored for him to join us tonight. Before we start, I, I just wanna mention briefly uh, that tonight's event has been pre-recorded, so we won't be able to take any audience questions, but thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the show. Uh, let me just begin by saying uh, thank you, Anne Marie and, and, and Aurora, who are going to be broadcasting this event. And for me, it's really a distinct pleasure. And I'd like to introduce uh, our two accomplished guests here. Uh, uh, first is Victoria Riskin, the daughter of Golden Age star Fay Ray and screenwriter Robert Riskin, author of Fay Ray and Robert Whisk Riskin, a Hollywood memoir and William Wellman Jr., son of legendary director William Wellman and actress-dancer Dorothy Coonan, and author of Wild Bill Wellman, Hollywood Rebel, and indeed he was. So um, Vicki and Bill, thanks for joining us and in, in doing this. This is great. And uh, the, the, the topic here is growing up in Hollywood. And uh, needless to say, that was when Hollywood was really Hollywood. Um, uh, both of you grew up and uh, you established yourself and you forged your own careers, uh, impressive careers separate from your parents. Uh, Vicki, starting with you, did your parents' fame make things easier for you or more difficult or how did that work for you? Yes and no. <laughs> to start That's off. Fair well, answer. Well, let me just say how nice it is to be with Bill, who, whose book I loved, and, uh, and to be with you, Alan, and, and Thank you. A, a great historian of, of Hollywood. Um, did, did their fame make it easier or harder to grow up? I think, well, first of all, I think um, I, I had two wonderful parents. And as long as I had them and had them together, because my father had a stroke when I was very young. Those early years, I think, laid a wonderful foundation for me, uh, both in terms of th they were very bright people, they were very funny, they were kind of magical, uh, and they loved uh, creating a, a magical environment for their children. So that part made it uh, pretty wonderful. At the same time, uh, you know, in the beginning, I realized I was a member of a very special club. I don't know if you felt this way, Bill, but wherever I went to school, people would say, are your, uh, are your parents in the business? <laughs> and everybody knew what business that was. It was only one business that counted in Los Angeles or in Hollywood, and that was the movie business. And you would say yes with a certain kind of pride and feeling like you were an insider um, but of course, as I got older, it was a little more complicated because as I, this is my psychology background, as I wanted to establish myself, my personality, be my own person, 
I didn't want to always be the daughter of the famous people or the famous mother or the woman who was in King Kong. I wanted to be just me. And so then it became a little bit of a shackle when I became more self-aware and self-conscious and shy and, you know, wanting to have friends on my own, you know, merit, so to speak. I don't know how it was for you, Bill. The, the analysis is beginning now. You understand that. <laughs> <laughs> how did it work for you bill with your with your uh parents particularly your dad because i know you went on location and did a lot of things with him well there were so many celebrities in the neighborhood i mean we we moved into this particular neighborhood in 1935 and there was only one film person in the neighborhood besides my father at that time, Milton Sills, a, a silent era. He, uh, he was there. And then within, I was born in 37. So by 1938 or 1939, they were coming in in, in bus loads <laughs> because originally the stars and the filmmakers, they wanted to be close to the studios that they worked at. But after a while, they said, you know, we want to work at the studios, but we don't want to live here. And they started moving out to Brentwood and Malibu and places like that. <clears throat> so I grew up, these were the people in my neighborhood, and I'm only talking two streets to the west, two streets to the east, and six blocks north of Sunset Boulevard. That's within that area, there was the Henry Fonda family, there was Tyrone Power, there was Gary Cooper, Van Johnson, I'm moving up the street, there were the Andrew sisters, there was Cesar Romero, there was John Payne married to Gloria De Haven. <clears throat> there was Gene Fowler, the writer, and above him was Robert Walker married to Jennifer Jones, there was Lana Turner, and now coming back down Barrington, there was Fred McMurray, there was Frank Capra. Now that was all on the west side. Now on the east side, we had Peter Lawford, Red Skelton, Bob Crosby, Bing Crosby's brother. There was Xavier Cugat. There were the Dix, Richard Dix, Irene Dunn, and my favorite of all of them, Hopalong Cassidy. <laughs> that was my neighborhood. Yeah. So Bill, it sounds like you could have held the Oscars in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and and when those that had children, you know, the Capras, you know, I, I hung out with the Capras and, you know, so we all kind of knew each other. So it was like we th I thought till I was about 12 or 13, these people were in everybody's neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so. But Bill, as Bill, as you grew up, did you find carrying your father's name to be a help in your own career or a hindrance or like Victoria, it was both good and bad? Well, it was more good, but there was some bad to it. Um, primarily because I loved my father and I think he was a great director, but he, he was somebody who he could cause a lot of problems. He had fights with producers. He had fights with actors. And I mean, fist fights. Um, there were studio uh, moguls that didn't want him around. So, I mean, I come into this and they go, William Wellman Jr., what the hell is this? You know, so there was a lot of skepticism about me. Mm -hmm. um, and I never knew when I met some celebrity, whether they had gotten along with my father or not. And, and, you know, a lot of times I would be very surprised, like the time that I met Anthony Quinn. And this was at the Ojai Valley Inn and Country Club, uh, a little bit north of Los Angeles. My father loved it and he used to take the whole family there on vacations. And so here's Anthony Quinn and I'm a, I'm a fan and I, I'm like 13 or something. And I walk over to him and, and introduce myself. And he looks at me and turns and walks away and say, get away from me. 
And I thought, what happened? And I went to my dad. I said, what's this with Anthony Quinn? That son of a... <laughs> said, now, Anthony Quinn worked in the Oxbow incident and mm -hmm. they had no problem in that. But this was Buffalo Bill just a few years later. Mm -hmm. And my father... And I've talked to people who worked on that film, even the assistant director. And my father was so upset with Anthony Quinn. He wouldn't ride his horse into the big battle scene. He didn't like the, the horse was hard for him to handle. So he wanted a double. Mm -hmm. And my father said, get off your horse. I'll ride your horse in. Give me your wig, you know, because Anthony Quinn is playing a, an Indian. Mm -hmm. And eventually they had a fist fight. So, Anthony Quinn was not too happy to have Bill Wellman Jr. anywhere near him. And this happened to be on a fairly regular basis with people. And then there were other people who loved my father. Yeah. They would, Loretta Young grabbed me and hugged me and wouldn't let go of me, you know? So that's, but that's, was, I would I would say that's definitely an attribute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still think, you know, uh, it was more of an attribute, certainly as, as a campaigning young actor, the fact that I had that name, people paid attention to it. So the point is, I better be doing good work because I'm going to be scrutinized, you know, 100% right away. Yeah, you know, uh, both of you, what struck me in both of your books was how family oriented your parents were both your parents. And I remember my good friend, David Ladd, Alan Ladd's son saying, you know, I'm always grateful that my parents brought us up normal, <laughs> quote unquote. And uh, so were either of you conscious, uh, like with a split personality, like for Vicky, uh, you had your mom and then you had Faye Ray. Is that how it worked? Yeah, I think it did. Well, a split personality might be a strong term. Uh, right. But, but there was mom at home. She loved to be in the kitchen puttering around. She was a good cook. Uh, when she packed me up to go to summer camp, we went, you know, got the, they usually have what they call lockers, you know, foot lockers. And mm -hmm. we picked out my clothes and she sewed my name and every single one of them. She she loved, uh, she made me fresh orange juice for breakfast every single morning. Every single morning she made me breakfast when uh -huh. she wasn't working. I mean, she really loved being a mom that way. And yet, of course, there were times when she would have to go off and work and she would leave me a little note, you know, have a wonderful day. But then we would go to the supermarket together and I'd be intent on getting a certain candy bar and uh, someone would stop her in the produce department and say, oh my God, I've loved every movie you've ever been in. And they would name every movie and they would, and she would turn on the, the movie star person, what I call a movie star personality. And her, her diction would change just slightly, you know, it would be a little bit more that Atlantic accent that actors used uh, in in uh, the 1940s and it's so lovely to meet you and thank you so much for your and mm -hmm. then they would ask for an autograph well you can imagine I just thought this was I'd be tearing my hair out because I wanted to move on and get my candy bar and they were not interested <laughs> in me or they might say do you have a lovely little girl and push me aside you know <laughs> So she was navigating all of that, trying to be gracious and at the right. same time move move on. But there was a definite personality that lit up uh, when we went out for dinner at Chasen's or some of the Espagos or some of the places in Hollywood that were famous. And I would, I was always sort of a, kind of an adjustment for me, an emotional adjustment between the regular mom who was a great friend and so sweet and funny and uh, someone who was a bit on stage. Right, right. Now, Bill, I know you went, uh, at, at a certain age, you went on location with your dad. Did you notice the, the public wild Bill Wellman and all of that? And then the guy that you called dad, uh, was, it, was it two separate uh, images rather, you know, or personality? 
notes that he would project or was he just wild Bill Wellman all the time? He was wild. He was pretty much wild Bill Wellman all the time. I mean, we, you know, I had uh, six brothers and sisters and, and uh, dad was a, you know, he, he ruled with an iron hand, you know, he wanted, you did what dad, and his first rule was whatever mother tells you do it. <laughs> and uh, so he was tough, but he was also loving to us. We all knew he cared about us. Uh, even though he was, you know, he was, he was tough in, in many ways, but that's what I saw. Now I went on 23 of his film sets and locations, starting from when I was just a little kid. I mean, Carol Lombard held me in her arms on Nothing Sacred in 1939. So, I mean, I, and I, I was always I going to Nothing Sacred. Location. I think that's got to be a moment that's... <laughs> Sacred, right? <laughs> well, I have the picture of it, but I don't really remember that. I do remember her coming over to the house one day, and um, her brother lived on the next street, and she came over to visit my dad. This was after Nothing Sacred, and um, they would laugh and scream, and oh my God, it was, I would come, you know, I would come downstairs. Now, at this time, I'm like, five and they would be laughing and telling jokes and having such a good time and I remember one time my father was sitting in his chair in the den and Carol Lombard was on the couch and she grabbed me when I came into the room and sat me down next to her and then they they continued with their conversations and laughing and everything and I remember just looking up at her and thinking how beautiful the blonde hair and you know, and I, it was so great. And to go on locations with my father, it was fabulous. You know, I just loved it. I loved watching movies being made. Absolutely terrific. Mm -hmm. Vicki, uh, were any of your parents, uh, any of their friends' names that some of our audience would remember? And I know being that your dad was a writer, uh, he, he had uh, some of his close friends were writers and screenwriters and such that were in the same business. All right. Well, certainly uh, there was a gang of screenwriters who uh, were smart and liberal and played poker together. And we had dinner parties and square dances at the house. Uh, we were in, we were in uh, Bel Air at first, Bill. So, uh, and then we moved to Brentwood near where you live, but, um, you know, there were there was a, a steady stream, Rosalind Russell, and and my favorite was Harpo Marx, of course, because who doesn't love the Marx brothers? And they were close friends, Susie and Harpo Marx. But when I first remember, we used to watch uh, on television. We used to watch the uh, Marx brothers, not on television. Not, we didn't even have television. We had a, a film that we would run on on rainy Saturdays. Uh, uh, I think it was maybe a night at the opera. Is that what? Or a day yeah, night at the opera, day at the races. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I just couldn't believe how funny he was with his curly hair and his horn and his trench coat and his his gags of handing his knee to somebody and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And so this gentleman came to the house for dinner and he was wearing a lovely silk uh, suit with a fancy handkerchief in his pocket and uh, an elegant tie and my mother said oh sweetheart there's that, that man you love so much Harpo Marx the man in the movies and I looked at him and I I just I thought why is she saying that he doesn't have he didn't look anything like the man in the movies I didn't understand <laughs> and so he said would it's lovely to meet you and he went to lift me on to his lap and I ran away and said this is terrible. Someone's playing a terrible joke on me and I don't like this at all. But we became friends later. But Ronald Coleman and, you know, there was a whole, it was just a steady stream of wonder, David Niven, uh, you know, and of course a lot of people who were, the, you know, the comedy writers of, of the era. Um, so there was a lot of playfulness. And then next door to us uh, was Charlie Brackett, Charles Brackett, who was Billy Wilder's partner. And he was famous for having great parties. Mm -hmm. 
lived a very elegant life. And um, so we were always sneaking through the fence to go into his backyard when there were parties and with the Cary Grants and the, you know, Joan Crawford. So the whole, the whole <laughs> laundry list of, of wonderful people. All of them were terrific, but of course had their, you now I know growing up that they had complicated lives uh, that we didn't always understand at the time. They would just seem like everything was so idyllic. Uh, things things are idyllic when you're if you're if you're if you're fortunate like I think the three of us are things do seem idyllic when you're a kid and adults seem larger than life and you know the 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 problems that all of us encounter as we go on uh, those folks had some of the same issues but we did you know you don't see them when you're a kid yeah, did I'm both Oh, well, I'm sorry, you go ahead, Vicki. No, I was just going to say that I think now, and I think maybe Bill from doing his book, I certainly know now from doing my book, I understand what was going on behind the scenes, and it wasn't just what was going on in the home, because all that was pretty good, but there was the blacklist era, there was the lead up to the war, there were the labor wars, there were all kinds of things that actually were points of tension the fights with the producers and with the moguls, you know, and it's actually much more interesting and more layered than our kind of bubble that we lived in. We right. Just didn't see it. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't. I just no, no, no. That that's that's fine. Um, both of you, it it really was a journey for both of you to write about your parents, to write a book about your parents. Uh, Bill, what made you decide to write uh, this? You know, and I, I recently just read it and it's, I couldn't put it down. I read your book like in two days and I just sat and read the book and then I would get up, eat, do what I have to do. I'd come back to it. And I did the same thing with, with Vicky's book. But Bill, what motivated you to, to write a, you know, 600, 700 page book about your dad? Um, uh, I well, mean, I, I, think I know the I answer have, to this, but I want you to tell it. <laughs> well, I have to, I have to go back to when I, you know, as as an actor, I remember in 1965, I was starring in a movie being made at Columbia Studios, the only movie that was being made at the time, Winter a Go Go. You can imagine that. <laughs> and I met the head of the studio, Mike Frankovich, and the the executives had no place to go except to come down and watch Winter A Go Go being shot because it was the only movie being made there at the time. But I decided at that time that I, here was an opportunity. I had met the head of the studio. He would come down on the set and I went to him and I said, you know, I would like to do something for my father. I don't think he gets the recognition that he deserves. And <clears throat> I'd like to do, uh, I'd like to write a book about him. Um, I'd like to do a documentary about him. And Frankovich was very nice about it. He says, well, he says, uh, let's think about that. Um, but nothing really happened. And from that point on, I wrote, I started writing and I wrote the, uh, a documentary which ended up being made, it took 25 years for it to be made. And it was beautifully made by uh, Todd yeah. Robinson and Ken Carlson and myself. We were the three uh, amigos to make this documentary. And I continued on to write two books about my father, <clears throat> all the time wanting to get the recognition for him. Now, <clears throat> in, nine, let's see, 1970, Three, I believe, uh, no one had ever done uh, a documentary about his life. And I wanted to get one done. And I started working on it. And I was talking to all kinds of people, John Wayne, Gregory Peck, you name it. And my father said, what the hell are you doing, Bill? No one cares about that. I said, well, I do, you know. So he really wasn't but he got, when, I, when it finally got done, um, the documentary, not the documentary, but I got his, uh, a retrospective of his work. This is the first and only thing I got done during his lifetime. 
-hmm. And we showed, I think it was 38 or 39 movies mm -hmm. at, a, at a public theater. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Cagney came out from Martha's Vineyard and we had a big gathering at Chasen's and um, the uh, theater showed all these films of my father's and he got on stage and, and incidentally he was so funny when he would be on stage in front of an audience because he would always say things that you'd duck, you'd go, oh my God, Dad, why are you saying that? But he, he could not direct himself. He said whatever came into his mind. No filter. <laughs> and a lot of times they might be embarrassing to someone else, but he said what he thought, you know? Yeah. Vicki, uh, so anyway. when you wrote about your mom and dad, I think one of the real poignant parts of your book for me were the letters that your dad and mom wrote back and forth during the war. Was this really a voyage of discovery and finding out uh, the dimension of your parents' love for one another and their relationship in, in doing that research and then writing about it? Yeah, it was, um, I, I had to ease my way up to those letters because my mother had given me the letters in this leather pouch that I had, had tucked away. And I had, uh, I would periodically pull them out and start to read them. <clears throat> And they were so extraordinary to read, <coughs> excuse me, and I would start to cry and I just put them back in the pouch and put them away. So I, I knew the time had come in writing the book to, to read through those letters. I had to actually hire someone to transcribe them, to, to type them out for me. Uh, partly because my father had very tiny handwriting and mm -hmm. also because some of them were a uh, V-mail. They were mail that had been shrunk and he wrote them when he was overseas and then they were shrunk before they were sent back to, to the United States to save on, on, on fuel when the airplanes would bring soldiers mail, you know. Right. So, so they were hard to read for that reason. Anyway, I hired a girl who had worked for a doctor. She could read anything, no matter how bad the handwriting was. And she transcribed them for me. And that began, I put them together chronologically and I began to re rebuild their relationship uh, from the time they were courting to the time they got married. And then he went overseas for the Office of War Information and wrote home. And it was just, it was just an explosion of uh, detail, information, love, humor. It was, they were extraordinary. And uh, so that they made, it made a big difference. But the other thing that motivated me to even do this, Alan, was um, someone making a documentary about my dad and his work during World War II for the Office of War Information. And they wanted to know as much as they could about who, where he was and what he was doing and who he saw mm -hmm. and how he put together this whole big project. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the letters were essential mm -hmm. for that. And I wanted to help them and that helped me, help myself to write that part of the book and rebuild well, it. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's truly wonderful and, and Bill, uh, the story. Alan, let, can, let me just say one thing sure, because sure. I don't know if you realize that uh, Vicky's family and my family have we have a, a connection in the film industry because my father made a film called Legion of the Condemned starring Fay Ray and uh, Gary Cooper. Right. And unfortunately, it's a lost film, but my father always said. It was every bit as good as Wings that he had made uh, around the same time. So true. that was one thing. And then uh, Robert Riskin was the producer and writer of, of my father's Magic Town. Um, and my father always had good things to say about, uh, about Riskin and, uh, and Magic Town. He liked it. Uh, you know what? Magic Town is a good movie and he did a great job. The challenge for Magic Town, which was with uh, Jimmy Stewart and Jane Wyman, mm -hmm. 
And actually, I just saw a movie last night that sort of borrows heavily. It's called Irresistible with uh, James. What's his name? Anyway, it's a comedy that just came out on HBO. Borrows heavily from Magic Town, in my view. But um, <clears throat> the film Magic Town, which is about a uh, a guy who is a pollster, a political pollster, and he he is being about to lose his job, but he's he knows he has found the most perfect town in America. And if he goes there and he asks people who they want to have as president or what they think about various topics, he will get the per he, it's the perfect demographic. And of course he comes to town and the fact that he comes to town changes the demographic. Anyway, the film came out and you may not realize this Bill, but it came out in October, 1947. The headlines every single day, the Hollywood headlines were about the Hollywood pen. Yeah. So there was no way, I mean, Hollywood was in the trough at, because of all of the scandal around the blacklist and everybody being hauled in before the HUAC committee. So Magic Town just didn't, couldn't find its little place in the sun. And I love it. Someone wants to do a musical out of it, by the way. So. No, I, I think it's, <laughs> I, I like it a lot too. And, but my father always, he kind of joked about it. <clears throat> you know, it didn't do a lot of business. And he said, well, it should have been made by Frank Capra is what my father used to say. But I think he did an excellent job. And I, there's nothing about the film I don't like. Yeah, me too. I think he did a great job. So let's yeah. just I think, I think I think it's time to start championing uh, Magic Town to be restored and, and put out there in Blu-ray if it hasn't already. Um, both of you, um, with your parents, uh, did you get involved? I think both of you did in their roots, like going back, Bill, in your case, going back to Boston, where your father grew up, and Vicky, uh, the sentimental trip that you took back to this teeny town in Utah where your mom grew up, Lark. Uh, Vicki, why don't you, you talk about that and then we'll, we'll uh, let Bill talk about Boston a little bit. What was well, that experience I, like uh, with your mom? Not only did I write about Lark, I actually went to Lark, which right, is, was right. a mining town. It was a town that was established because of the Kennecott mines, copper mines. And the only job my grandfather could get was as the night foreman in this little dusty, miserable town. And uh, but my mother was there. She wasn't born there, but she grew. There were her seminal years, six to twelve or so. She she was in this little town. I had a big influence on her. They were quite poor, and um, and it was humiliating for her mother to have been in those circumstances because her mother had had a college degree, unusual, in mm -hmm. the late 1800s for a woman to have a teaching degree. She was a very smart, very proud woman. And so this was a tough, tough place, but my mother kind of loved it, you know, it was scrappy and fun and crazy. And, and we, uh, but the Kennecott company uh, didn't need the, the mine closed up and they were gonna just level the whole town. So in 1977, my mother and I went to, we flew to Lark. Uh, we flew to Salt Lake City and then drove to Lark. And the fun part about the story is that we got in, we rented a car to drive to Lark. And she says, it takes all day to get there. So we better take provisions. Now, my mother's language was starting to change. You know, I was like, I said, does that mean a tuna fish sandwich? And she said, yeah, that means a tuna fish sandwich. We'll take provision. You know? <laughs> and we got in the car and in a 20 minutes down the highway was a sign to Lark. And I said, here it is. She said, oh no, it takes all day to get there. Well, she'd gone in horse and by horse and buggy. And <laughs> this was a very different journey. Anyway, we went, we went to this little, now falling apart town except for one woman who refused to move uh and we walked around and her whole life growing up came alive for me you know the sight of the miners coming back at the end of the day with their lanterns the boarding house where the rough guys lived and the little building where there was a church 
And on Sunday nights, they showed movies. And someone put up a bed sheet and there was a guy at the piano and they showed the uh, Mary Pickford movies. And I think then she fell in love with the movies, you know, and who wouldn't? I mean, everybody fell in love with the movies at that point. Bill's father and my mother uh, and my father, we all, they all started in the silent movies. And uh, of course, Bill's dad made a fabulous transition to the talkies. My mother had to prove that she sounded all right, you know, that she could, she could speak. But at the time she said, I don't think these talkies are gonna succeed because who wants to hear people talk? <laughs> so used to seeing the, the, the theatrics of, of of the that silent, was a, silent right? films were really an international language of it, silent films, the acting and the music. And it was a, a language all its own that transcended cultures and languages. That's right. And Mary Pickford was a, more famous than anybody else in the entire world when she was making mm -hmm. movies. So, uh, so that was at least a, my mother's journey, of course, became more complicated. They moved to Salt Lake City. And then uh, a young man, when my mother was 13, 14, my, my mother's older sister had a boyfriend who said, I think I could take Faye to Hollywood and get her in the movies. And she got on the train in her little dress with her little suitcase with this 21 year old young man. And he said to her, you know, it's not your sister I'm in love with, it's you. And she was all by herself. And fortunately, nothing terrible happened, but she said, I felt so old and so confused. And yet, you know, when she got to Hollywood, uh, things began to happen for her because she was just, she was a survivor. She was. Yeah. And, and Bill, your, your, your father went from Boston to, to uh, fighting in the war and so forth. And I know uh, he was very close to his mom who had a very, lived a long life. Did you go back to Boston and revisit some of your uh, father's uh, youthful places and escapades with him as a family? Yeah, I had gone back there before. Um, and I was a freshman at Duke University. And at semester break, I joined my mother and father uh, in Florida. Uh, my father's brother lived in Palm Beach. And uh, so I went down there and we kind of tooled around and saw sights, you know, and uh, and Boston. And that was the first time that I, I did all of that. <clears throat> and then I went back again when I finished the documentary and we showed it at my father's neighborhood theater in Boston. That's great. That was one of the screening events and that was very special. And your, and your father's where you talk about a spectacular entrance on arriving in Hollywood in a plane. And why don't you tell that story real briefly? Because I think our listeners, uh, those of you who haven't read your book, would really get a kick out of that. How your father literally arrived in Hollywood. Well, he was a fighter pilot in the First World War. He had six major air crashes. And the last one, or the second to the last one, uh, he was pretty busted up and he came back to the United States and he ended up going to uh, San Diego and being a flight instructor down there at Rockwell Field in San Diego, mm -hmm. wondering about what he was gonna do with the rest of his life. Now, he had, he had met Douglas Fairbanks when my father was playing ice hockey in Boston. And Fairbanks had said, well, if you ever come out to Hollywood, look me up. So my father's down at Rockwell Field. He's kind of gotten over his injuries and he thinks, well, maybe this is the time. And he reads in the newspaper that Douglas Fairbanks is having a big polo party at the Will Rogers Polo polo field and all of Hollywood's going to be there. Charlie Chaplin and I mean, all, 
Norma Talmadge, all the stars. So he takes his spad aircraft down at Rockwell Field and he flies up and lands on the polo field in the <laughs> middle of a game. The polo ponies are skittering all over the place. My father lands his spad, gets out of it, and he's got his best uniform on and all his ribbons and everything and his medal. And he walks up to Fairbanks and he said, Mr. Fairbanks, do you remember me? <laughs> and that was, you know, that was my father's uh, introduction and into Hollywood. And uh, Fairbanks said to him at that time, he said, look, um, can you ride a horse? And my father said, well, no, but I've ridden everything else I could learn. And Fairbanks gave him the, uh, the young lead in his next picture, which was a Western called the Knickerbocker Buckaroo. Uh, I love the title. I know. <laughs> That's, that, that is a, a quite a flamboyant entrance. Um, Vicki, you mentioned uh, uh, your parents and their friends and liberal circles. I think one of the things that comes through in both of your books is both your parents, uh, all your parents, both your, yours and Bill's, were very progressive when it came to politics, when it came to race. Uh, and that, that, uh, that type of uh, attitude and mindset certainly wasn't mainstream uh, back when you guys were coming up. Uh, how did their outlook on things like that rub off on both of you? Oh, I think I am, it totally rubbed off on me. I mean, I, I think I grew up with the view that it was important to appreciate every human being and care for the little guy. You know, that was, that was a theme in all Robert Riskin films. The yeah. appreciation for the common man, as uh, some have called it. I don't think of anybody as common, but as yeah. regular you know, regular people are good. Right. We should look after each other. That was such a big, you know, part of it was from my family and particularly my father coming from first generation Jewish kid growing up uh, on the Lower East Side and then in Brooklyn. And his parents, his father was a strong progressive, partly because his father worked in, gar in the garment factory business. You know, he would come in and do work for two or three. My father said he never knew his father had a steady job and he probably never did, but he would come in and do piece work and it was rough. And, but at the same time, they were intellectuals. They'd grown up influenced by the enlightenment of Europe, the, this notion of uh, democracy and fairness uh, and justice. These were all very strong values. So uh, he loved, my dad loved the country. He loved um, the democratic principles. Um, and he, he didn't wear his politics with a strong demo, as a Democrat on his sleeve, but he was a Democrat. He loved FDR. He thought FDR really cared about uh, rescuing the country. So this influenced every single thing he wrote. There isn't anything he wrote, even in uh, perhaps the, the least political is it happened one night. But there you, you, you have uh, a young woman who's uh, grown up in wealth and it's frustrating to her. She feels trapped, mm -hmm. she wants to break out of it. And she falls in love with this kind of charming ne'er do well, and um, uh, Clark Gable. But they, there are the social differences. So he's trying. My dad was trying to make the divide and make the bridge. Not saying one side was wrong and the other was right, but but yeah. blend together the country. And and then of course, and I'd love to hear Bill's view on this. If his dad went through what what um, my, my you know they were the labor wars were powerful in hollywood people mm -hmm. were really fighting for a fair deal for fair compensation not to be owned by the studios to have some agency mm -hmm. of their own be respected 
not to have Michael Curtiz work you seven days a week, 15 hours a day yeah. before the <laughs> formation of the Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> all of that stuff. All of that, all of yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah. Very fertile time, plus a very tense time with the rise of, of people in the country following Hitler. Yeah. Lindbergh. Yeah. Lionizing Hitler yeah. and um, and others lionizing Stalin. It was it was an intense time. So he was navigating. They were yeah. navigating all of that. Bill, I know your dad always took up for the underdog, and he yeah. he always was someone that looked into someone and the content of their character, not what color they were or anything else. Uh, what what what's your perspective on that? regarding well, your father. You're absolutely right. He he was always for the underdog and he felt that everybody was equal, you know. He, uh, I, I told this story to somebody just the other day. When I was five years old, uh, now we're living in Brentwood. Right. And my father uh, knew the people that lived at the top of the street and they had a, uh, a black, uh, chauffeur and the chauffeur's wife was the cook of this family mm -hmm. and <clears throat> they my father was up there one time and the and the couple that did the you know the housework and everything they were concerned because their little boy um they didn't know what to do with him they spent so much time up at this at this house taking care of things and my father said well who's your boy and he says well, his name is georgie and he's a little black kid, five years old. And my father said, well, drop him off at my house. I'm, I'm on the street just below where you're going and he can play with my boy, Bill. So they did that. And for a long time, and, Je and Georgie and I were pals. We were both five years old. And I, I love the fact that I had that. And I don't know if my father had the intent of wanting me to be an unprejudiced type of individual, but it certainly worked because this Georgie was my friend. Yeah. And so I never, I never had another, when I went to Duke, uh, this is during segregation and everything in the fifties. I, I, you know, I, I was very unhappy with, with a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And I think it stems from the fact that my, my best friend was a black kid. And your father also, I remember reading, he gave Sidney Poitier, cast him in one of Sidney's early films. And then uh, there was an incident where the hotel wouldn't, they wouldn't let him stay at a hotel where they were shooting the film. And uh, your father w made sure that he ate with him or something. What was the, what was the yeah, story? Yeah, well, <clears throat> they, they wouldn't let Sidney stay at the hotel with the company. And they put him up at a, a black college that was just outside of, of, of the town. Uh, and my father didn't like it when he heard about that. And uh, so he said to the manager of the hotel, he said, uh, you know, I don't like this. S Sydney's a member of our, of our company. You know, I want him here. So the guy said, well, he can eat in the kitchen. Oh my gosh. So you know, and my father, you know, was furious. He ended up calling the manager outside and he said, now, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to make sure that Sydney stays here at the hotel or I'm going to knock you on your ass right now. <laughs> my know, he was guy. furious about the my whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't let Sydney stay in the hotel, but my father said okay and my father ate in the kitchen with Sydney mm -hmm. and he was just furious about the whole thing he, he yeah. didn't like it he didn't understand it and mm -hmm. he, he was ready to fight for it mm -hmm. and Sydney told me that you know when we did the documentary and I I had Sydney uh do it on camera for us and I wanted him to tell that story and he wouldn't tell it exactly the way the way it was but he did say that, you know, how much he appreciated the way my father treated him. But he wouldn't go into the details, which he right. could have, about eating in the kitchen and all that. But right. I guess yeah. a little heavy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. So my father, you know, my father was so unprejudiced and was just unbelievable. And politically, that's another funny thing because he was a registered Republican, but he would cross the aisle if he saw a better man. He, he was not stuck into the party. And people thought for a long time when he was doing all those films with John Wayne and John Wayne, who's the, you know, the, the, the aggressive Republican guy. Yeah. thinking my father, Wild Bill Wellman, well, he's, that's the way he is. But my father, I remember he, he did a Merv Griffin show, an interview type show on television. And he was, and he was saying that uh, he voted for Harry Truman, no, over Thomas Dewey. He voted for the Democrat. He started to talk about the candidates that he voted for that weren't Republicans, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that was just the way he was. He, he wanted to find the best man for the job. That was his politics. Uh, as, we're, as we're starting to wrap up here in terms of time, Vicki, I wanted to ask you, your mom made over 100 movies, television shows, but she really achieved immortality for one film, King Kong. Uh, was this ever exasperating to her based on her body of work, although it did seem, uh, I have her memoir, by the way, that she signed, uh, that's in my bookcase, and the title is On the Other Hand, right. was a direct reference to Kong, so it seemed uh, like she came to embrace the whole Kong phenomenon, which has gone from generation to generation. How did your mom feel about that? Yeah, I think she went through different uh, feelings over time. Um, at the time she made King Kong that year, she made 10 other films, and uh, including Dr. X and Mystery of the Max Museum and Most Dangerous Game. I, I think she, at that time, felt, oh, I'd love to do some other kind of film where I'm not being pursued by... Yeah, without, without Lionel Atwell after her in a lab packet or something. <laughs> <laughs> and she did uh, some lovely films, uh, what I call B-plus films after, after that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but everyone remembers her for one film, and that's yeah. King Kong. And I think she came to realize, she loved Marion C. Cooper and, and Monty Shodzak, who, who mm -hmm. were the, the creators of the film. Right. And, and so that was nothing but a wonderful experience and a lifetime friendship. But she came to appreciate uh, the place King Kong had in film history and how, what a breakthrough film it was at the time and how people still love it to this day. Young kids still see the original 1933 film and will come up to me and say, oh, I fell in love with your mother. So it has an enduring, it's just absolutely endured. So, so later uh, as she, was living in New York and not working anymore. She used to say, I every once in a while, while walk by the Empire State Building and look up and say, you know, a good friend of mine died up there. <laughs> she found many wonderful ways. She wrote about my New York in the, for the New York Magazine, New York Times Magazine section and about her relationship to the city and to the Empire State Building and to Kong. And then, of course, in her own uh, autobiography, she wrote a letter to Kong. I don't know if you remember. Yes, that. I remember that. That's and right. She writes to him and says, you know, I'm not sure where you are. I think you're still on Skull Island. I'm assuming you're retired. I hope this letter gets to you because I don't have the zip code for Skull Island. But I want <laughs> you to know. Skull Island was before <laughs> zip codes. <laughs> I want you to know what you met in my life, and I hope I met something in your life. So she was kind of uh, wonderfully playful and imaginative with the whole Kong uh, experience, legend, and history. And then naturally, at the end of her life, she was invited to all of these wonderful uh, film festivals Mm -hmm. where she came out on stage, you know, as the great legendary Fay Ray. And without King Kong, I'm not sure she would have been as legendary. Yeah. I remember Billy Crystal introducing her at the Oscars, and she was in like the fourth or fifth row near the front, and she got this tremendous affectionate ovation. Yeah. 
yeah. which yeah. must have been very well sweet. it was you know it was I, she was i i was in love with with fay ray from that picture uh i just love that picture and it's such a powerful picture uh i know it's difficult you know in all the films that she did but but that's what people remember because it was yeah. it made such an impression and not just on one generation, but generation after generation after generation, mm -hmm. uh, the picture is fabulous, and she's beautiful and fabulous in the picture. It just it's uh, we <laughs> showed it at the the Hollywood Legion drive-in that I'm involved in. We showed it like a couple nights ago, and it was sold out. I mean, yeah. it, it's just it, it is an eternal it is a, an eternal movie. Bill, your father's movies uh, did he have a favorite? And I'll say for me, the two movies of your father's that, that are special to me are The Oxbow Incident and The Story of G.I. Joe. Well, those two. Those, are my father's, those were my father's favorites too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> those there were his go. favorite films. There's no question about they're, it. And they're, they're, <clears throat> these, are, these are like similar to Kong. These are the films that no matter how technology has changed and uh, everything has changed so much in our culture, when you watch films like King Kong uh, with Faye and those films, those films of your father's, they just uh, stand the test of time. And I know he, he essentially had to make a, a real cutthroat deal with Daryl Zanuck just to make the Oxbow incident, correct? Yeah, that took a long time. Uh, he... Uh the writer, I'm trying to think of the, the man who wrote the book, The Oxbow Incident. <clears throat> he uh, found my, my father was on a vacation at the Arrowhead Hot Springs Hotel with my mother and this uh, producer, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. He wanted to get this movie made, The Oxbow Incident. Mm -hmm. So he came with a book and gave it to my father at the, at the hotel. Mm -hmm. And my father read it and loved it. And when he came back, he wanted to make that film, but nobody wanted to make that film. The Hanging of Innocent Men. I mean, no one wanted to make that film. Yeah. And he finally uh, got Zanuck, he, he got Zanuck to read the book. Mm -hmm. And finally Zanuck said, well, it'll never make a dime but I want it, I want to make it, and I want to have my name on it. Wow. And so finally, uh, they got it made. And, and, you know, it was nominated as one of the best pictures for an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. People don't realize it was nominated. And how often does a picture get nominated for best picture and no other nominations? That's, That's the Oxford Winston. Best picture, but... People said, this is a great picture, but we don't know how to cut it up in pieces, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, well, so it's any rate. One for, one for the ages, no question. It is. It, there's absolutely no question about it. And uh, we're right at an hour, and I think the runtime on this is uh, about 40 minutes. Uh, do you want to keep going, or do you want to wrap it up? Up to you guys. I, uh, I just... Well, one thing I want to do is say thank you to the University of Kentucky Press yes. for, for doing our paperbacks. First of all, I want to say thank you to Bill, because when I was in the middle of writing my book and I was thinking, why am I even doing this, right? <laughs> so much trouble, mm -hmm. so much work. I called him and I, I had an edit. I had, I had the same editor that, that Bill had, and I said, did you survive? How did you get through this? Because it is a lot of work. And oh, you, yeah. you were very reassuring and encouraging. So thank you to you, Bill. And then and then um, the University of Kentucky Press did a new cover, which I love because oh, nice. it has a picture of Faye and Bob when they were. Oh, great. This is at the Stork Club in New York, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, you can just see how they look. Yeah, I can. Right? Yeah. Well, right. I, will, I will give I will give equal time <laughs> <laughs> to both of you guys, both of you guys, and um, uh, 
And it's certainly, this was really, really a pleasure. And I'm, I'm fond of both of you and there's so much history here. And both your books, uh, uh, Bill's and, and Vicki, yours are just absolutely essential. And it's, uh, you know, your books will stand the test of time, I think, like both of your parents' movies. Uh, it's well, really thank good. you, Alan. I appreciate and, that. And uh, um, I also want to thank uh, the University of uh, University Press of Kentucky for putting this on. And they published my weighty tome on uh, Michael Curtiz, uh, A Life in Film. And I appreciate them doing this very, very much. And I appreciate them asking me to host this because uh, this, for me, this is, uh, this is Nirvana sitting here talking with you guys. So I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And Vicki, it was nice when I was able to meet you at the uh, Brentwood Country Mart. Remember, you were doing a book signing. I was so honored that you came. I was just thrilled. Thank you. Oh, I didn't give I, you I was... a hug, so I'm giving you a hug now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Cyber hug. Give it back. Give it back. <laughs> Cyber hugs. Cyber hugs. Cyber hugs. <laughs> Well, okay. I hope I hope one day comes where the three of us can be together at an event, or signing books, or doing something as we uh, as we get through this COVID and things more or less return to normal. Uh, but at any rate, it's been a joy, and thanks so much for uh, for allowing me to do this with you guys. Thank Stay you. safe, Alan. Stay safe. Okay. You too, guys. Okay. Love to both of you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks so much again for joining us. This is Anne-Marie Gaddy from Classic Movie Hub. And Aurora, Citizen Screen. See you next time.